Welcome Facebook Live Replay. We appreciate you for tuning in. I feel like I'm the one that gets to learn the most because I get to interview the great Jordan Adler and I actually wrote about him and I know he's very visual. We've talked about this, but I wrote about him in, in my book and what I wrote about is, is how this guy gets the law of the buy-in as well or better than anybody. And my experience was I knew who Jordan was. I had read his book right when I got in the industry back in 2008. And I get in this industry and I'm like, I got to read, I got to read, I got to read, I got to read, I got to learn, I got to become this leader I want to become. And in order to become this great leader, I've got to start reading all of these books. So I read this book, Beach Money. I start to look at this legend. Jordan is, is somebody who was a mentor to me. He didn't know that at all. And I show up to him several years ago at GoPro. And I was introduced by Josephine and Chris Gross, who wrote the networking. They, they, they're the publishers of Networking Times. He has no idea who I am. He doesn't know if I'm somebody who just started the industry. He doesn't know if I'm a leader. At this point in time, I had had a lot of success in the network marketing industry. But Jordan doesn't even know. And this is a true testament to who he is. He comes to me right when he meets me and he says he's thinking about writing another book. And he starts asking me for my opinion on certain titles on this particular book. And I thought, how amazing is this? This is a guy who's made millions of dollars that doesn't come off as arrogant at all, starts asking me questions, starts asking for my opinion. And I thought right away, I mean, I'm an even much bigger fan because someone who has 150 plus thousand distributors in, in his organization, somebody who is a best-selling author, is asking me questions right away before he even knows who I am or what I am. So Jordan, you didn't know I was going to say that. We didn't talk about topics or anything like that, but I just wanted to salute you and tell you it's been an honor getting to know you a lot better and getting to know that you really are the person that you convey in your books. And so I just, before I start asking questions, I just wanted to say thank you and thank you for being on. I know you're up at your cabin hanging out right now. And so this is taking time from that life that you've earned to enjoy, to be able to provide value for us. I love doing this, Rob. And it's great to be able to visit with you and everybody else for a little while. So thanks for the invite. Absolutely. So what people don't know is a lot of times we fast forward. And we look at the success that people have had, people like yourself, and, and we put you up here and we just think Jordan just had it. Jordan was just natural. Jordan just went out and made things happen. We think either you're good at something or you're not. And unfortunately, many times we miss that journey along the way. We miss a lot of those failures. We miss a lot of those times where you were vulnerable and you have those struggles. And I think that's really important for us to understand because although there aren't shortcuts to success, there are faster routes. Now, the faster route doesn't mean it's an easy route. It can be extremely hard, but I look at it like climbing Mount Everest. If you're going to climb Mount Everest, if you've got a tour guide who's really good, they can say, hey, don't go that way. That way is the wrong way. It's going to take you twice as long. Or you need to take a break because the storm's coming right now. Or we've got to hurry really quickly to get to the next peak because the storm's coming. And so I look at a lot of the insights that you can provide it, is really helping us to climb that Mount Everest of network marketing. And so my first question is, I know that you had a ton of tough times as you went through this business because everybody does. And I know specifically you had a lot of tough times. I love how relatable you are. So I want you to tell us a little bit about some of those tough times and what changed for you? What did you have to do to turn things around when you were going through tough times, when you were getting your butt kicked? And let us know what you had to do. And before you answer that question, or while Jordan's answering that question, I want all of you to show us that you're alive on, on this Facebook Live. Jordan's going to answer the question. Show him some love and drop in some comments here of showing some appreciation for Jordan. It could be your favorite emoji. It could be a big thank you, whatever it is. But Jordan, share, share some of the love for us, share some of the insight for us to help save us some time as we go through some of these struggles in our business. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. Thank you. And you know, um, when it really comes down to it, none of us are as good as we think we are. Um, the, the, way that, um, the, way that, the way that it works in real life, um, the way that uh, 
people become big in network marketing in real life is very different than what most people think. Um, usually what happens is at some point you learn your company presentation and you just start giving it even though you're afraid to give it, even though you're not confident, even though you're doubting. And you start doing that consistently every day and you do it a lot for a long period of time. And eventually what, what ends up happening is somebody joins your business and that helps to increase your confidence a little bit when someone says yes. And then your confidence goes down again when, you're, when, when people quit. And you keep doing that for, even though, you know, sometimes you'll sponsor three people or five people or 10 people or eight people uh, or 10 people or eight or 15 people or 20 or, or even 50 people and your organizations will sprout and then they'll die and then they'll sprout. And then eventually what happens? This is how it happens in real life. Someone joins your business, usually on your second, third, fourth, fifth or sixth level. Usually it's not somebody that you brought in. They join your business and they don't even know you or they have no connection to you, but they see it, they, they get it, and, they, and they're well networked and they're a good communicator and they're, they're ready, the timing's right, and they go off and they build an organization of thousands of people. And your income spikes, your income goes up, your residual income goes up, and then everyone you know, sees you on stage, they, the company wants you to you know, speak at the conventions because your income's going up and they wanna know your secret. And, and what ends up happening People are asking for your autograph and they're asking for your picture. And really what happened was your 25th distributor, after you'd been in the business for three years, sponsored somebody who sponsored somebody who sponsored someone else. And that thousand distributors, they built an organization. They were a strong leader. And the result of that is your check spiked and now everyone wants to know your secret. And there really isn't a secret. It's just that you did presentations when you were fearful and doubtful and uncertain and you kept doing them over and over and over again. And to answer your question, because I know I haven't answered your question about struggles, um, you know, in the beginning, I, uh, I, I picked up a book at a garage sale for a quarter. Um, and it was, and this was back when there were only about three or four books written on the topic of network marketing. In fact, your first year in network marketing by, by Mark Darnell hadn't been written yet. Um, Big Al's book, um, uh, which is called Big Al Tells All, phenomenal classic book. Um, that book was written, and, and then there was this book called uh, The Ten Napkin Presentations, The Basics, The Ten Napkin Presentations by Don Vela. And I read that book that I got at this garage sale, and it was the first time in my life, I was, I was young, you know, I was in my 20s, and it was the first time in my life that I heard the phrase residual income. And I liked it. I, I read it, and I liked it, and I, I got it. I got the idea of what residual was and how you could compress time frames and how you could leverage your time through the work of other people. And I couldn't communicate it the way I can communicate it today. But when I read the book, I'm like, I want this. I want the freedom that comes with this. And so, you know, you think about the tragedy that's going on in Houston right now and all the tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people that are hurting right now. And you see the story hour after hour after hour of people that are they're losing their livelihoods. You know, their income has stopped because their businesses have been shut down. People that have invested their life savings in businesses that are now, it's done. Like they can't go back. Even their insurance in some cases isn't gonna cover it. People that had jobs. But the network marketers, it's still tragic for them. They've lost everything. The network marketers that live in Houston, they've lost everything except that they still have a check coming in every month. Why? Because their income does not come from one place. It comes from thou thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of customers that are all over the world in some cases. And that flows into a bank account. So they have the resources to rebuild. I was sitting here in my home in the mountains thinking about trying to put myself in the shoes of one of these people that lost everything. And then and not having an income stream and not having any money saved and what do you do? You walk back, now the water subsides, you go back to your home, you look around, you see sludge up to the window tops and it smells and the walls are falling apart and every, your refrigerator and all your appliances are covering, covered in slime and you have no money. Like what do you, where do you even start? You know, you can't clean it out. It's not something you can just take a hose and clean it off. You got to have, and that's why network marketing, you know, it's like, um, what did Harvey McKay say in his book? Um, he said, um, 
I think it was Harvey McKay that said, dig your well before you're thirsty. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the title of his book, Rob? Dig, dig yeah. your well before you're thirsty. And, and that's just one of the many benefits that network marketing provide. When I read that book, the 10 napkin presentations, I saw all of this. Like I saw, I need to do this now. I was, I was working at the um, state of Arizona and I, this was back when you could smoke inside. And the guy uh, uh, on, in, in the cute, he was in a cubicle right across from me and he had been there for 25 years working for the state and he was smoking cigars all day long he was smoking cigars and the place was filled with smoke, it was horrible. And I remember thinking to myself, I gotta get out of here. I don't wanna be like Elvio and be here for 25 years, you know? I mean, the guy was miserable after being at the state of Arizona in the same cubicle for 25 years. And so when I read this book, I'm like, this opened up a whole new world to me. And you know what, I followed that dream, even though I was in 11 network marketing companies over the course of 10 years, all individually, not at the same time, in fact, I don't think I was ever in two at the same time. But in night in uh, in the early '80s, I joined my first one, and then um, in, I was in eleven companies in ten years and never signed up one person, never got a check. But I always held on to that dream. I quit over and over and over again, which was not a good strategy for success. That was the the thing that the thing that really ultimately will allow you to get through the struggles and the hardships, the the naysayers, the negativity the setbacks that come with just not having a lot of financial resources and running into issues like not being able to go to your company convention or not having enough money to buy product or, or um, you know, a, a long string of no's and, you know, you want to be able to buy people lunch, but you don't have money for lunch to buy people lunch or whatever it is. The thing that um, will help you is the defining moments that are created as a result of going through those hardships. And the defining moments happen not very often, but when they do, they change everything. And I had, I, I had a bunch of those, but I can remember two or three, like right at the top, that were like huge defining moments for me. Uh, one was walking the railroad tracks in the rain, uh, very, being very, very depressed and deciding, uh, I wasn't gonna do anything drastic, but deciding that I needed to regroup and the next day, taking a trip to the Grand Canyon, taking a day off work, time without pay. And uh, I went to the Grand Canyon and I took a journal and I wrote the story of my life in the present tense as if it had already happened. Wow. And when, when I wrote that, that was a defining moment for me. Even though nothing in that journal materialized for over three years, but just writing it in the journal changed everything for me. That, that was the first, that was one. Another one I remember was sitting around a table. I'd never made, I'd never sponsored a distributor in network marketing. And I'd been in network marketing for over 10 years. Never signed up one person. And I was a different person then than I am today. And I always would sit in the front row when I would go to events. And so because I would go back to these events, I'd sit in the front row, people started recognizing me and coming over and shaking my hand and saying, nice to see you. And I got to know people in the company and eventually I would go up and introduce myself to the speakers. Well, I got invited in San Francisco. I got invited to a dinner with the top five money earners in my 12th network marketing company. Again, I'd never signed up a single distributor, 10 years. So I get invited to this dinner in San Francisco. I did not pay to go to San Francisco. A distributor uh, in my upline paid to have me there because he saw that I really wanted this. He invited me to this. He and his wife invited me to this dinner. And I sat, I sat and I listened to all these top money earners talking about their stories. And I thought to myself, you know what? Their stories are just like mine. They're just like mine. It's just that I haven't wrote the second half of the story yet. And I, it, they were relatable and they were normal people. And I realized that um, I can do this. That was like a defining moment where I go, you know what? I can do this. Soon as I That's got that. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Sorry. No, I was just going to, I mean, I've got so many notes on the stuff you're saying. If you guys, if this resonates with you, drop an amen in the comments. I mean, you said, dig your well before you're thirsty from, you know, Harvey McKay. Uh, what I like to say is same thing is build your ark before it rains. Too many times people, they're, they're takers. And if you read the book, Give and Take by Adam Grant, he talks about if, if you're an ambitious giver, how ambitious givers win. So you got to be ambitious, but givers beat takers. And it's because they're focused on provide value, provide value, provide value. You do with ambition in the end, you win. And that's what Jordan is. That's what Jordan was, was an ambitious giver. I love how 
Think how powerful this is. He went out and wrote in the present tense his story. Present tense. Go out and create your story. Imagine if you started reading that. I know for me, I wrote out what my goals were, my my proclamation to the world, whatever you want to call it. And I had to read that thing morning and night to empower me to have the courage to go out and overcome my fears. Because people don't understand that people like you and I, we were freaked out of our minds. My phone weighed, I think, four or 500 pounds in my first 100 calls because every single person I called, I just prayed it would go to voicemail. I remember calling thinking, please don't answer. Please don't answer. I'm working, but I don't want you to answer. Please don't answer. And they'd, yeah. and I'd, they'd be like, what's going on? I'd be like, hey, uh, what, what are you doing right now? Like, I hope they were going to tell me they were too busy to talk because right. I was that scared. And then when they'd call me back, I didn't want to answer. So I remember yelling to my wife, hey, do you need help with the dishes or the trash? And I remember her looking at me. What, who is this guy? Who is this husband? He's asking to help me with the trash and the dishes. And then I love how you talked about, you didn't say this, but this is what you said in my interpretation is you talked about the struggle and how the struggle can become, can, can become the biggest part of your story, can, if you're willing to overcome it. And he talked about how he wrote his story in the present, how he, he almost had to reach that low point to say, Hey, I'm sick and tired of being where I'm at. I'm sick and tired of just being a survivor because there's victims. Victims blame in everything, everybody else, and they just quit. There's survivors. Jordan was a survivor. He didn't quit. He kept hanging on the industry, but he wasn't taking enough massive action. And then there's conquerors. And at some point, he got to that low point where he said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of just being a survivor. And he said, I want to be a conqueror. And so I, I hope that you really took notes and you caught a lot of those little insights that he gave because those are really, really in-depth. And I know that you teach us, and when I say you teach, you teach two very, very simple principles that have helped you to dream big, to stretch yourself, to do the impossible, that have helped people to have success. And I'd love for you to share what those two simple principles based on your experience well, are and yeah teach. they're not they're not really principles as but these are really just simple phrases simple like transformational phrases that are extremely powerful and i use them every day and they're subtle that most people miss how powerful they are so the first one and the, i mean i'm talking like this is this is stuff that can trans completely transform your results uh, the first one is making suggestions. So when you're meeting with somebody or you're trying to set up an appointment, instead of just asking questions, which it's important to do, at some point, make suggestions. So, for mm -hmm. example, when I'm, when I'm sitting down with somebody um, and they're thinking about getting started in the business, but they're not pulling the trigger, I'll say something like, do you mind if I make a suggestion? And then I'll give them a suggestion. Like, why don't we get you set up on this? So it's a suggestion. So I do that a lot. Can I make a suggestion? This weekend, we're having a special event. Why don't you just come and check it out? Sit in the front row, take notes. And after it's over with, just then make your decision. Like, don't make your decision right now. Let me just suggest. So I make suggestions. That's a, that's a huge thing. And I do that a lot. And, and, I, and I do it a lot. And I learned it. I learned it many, many, many years ago. And it's very powerful. The second one that again is transformational in any business and the people that start doing this that aren't doing it will see dramatic increases in their business along as long as they're in action both of these require you to be in action i mean you can't make suggestions sitting on your couch right that's not going to work you got to be out doing something right but the second one is i call it permission to continue have you heard that one before rob permission I have not to continue heard that one. i'm not down that's all that's all you do is you ask, per, and I, I kind of incorporated it in with a suggestion, but um, asking permission to continue is just simply asking them if it would be all right if you asked them a question or if you showed them something. So you get their buy-in first before you do it. Now you don't ever get objections when you do that. You never get object, or I shouldn't say that, you rarely get objections when you ask permission to continue before you offer some advice or a suggestion, or ask a question. Like, Rob, do you mind if I ask you a really serious question? No, go ahead. 
that's permission. That's getting your permission to continue. So now you're leaning in rather than pushing back. Mm. So I, I'll ask a question like, do you mind if I ask you a question? And then I'll say, here, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Rob, do you mind if I ask you a really serious question? No. Just say yeah. yes. Go ahead. Okay, no, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Do you love what you're doing? Now, I know you do, doing what you do. But let's say you had a job. You know, I yeah. can ask things. There are I, parts I, I ask, like. There are parts I don't like. It's It depends yeah, on the day. Right. Yeah, so, but the point is that whenever you do that, so like, for example, um, I'm, I'm halfway through my presentation and I, I might say something like, would it be okay with you right now if I showed you a little bit about the compensation plan? So I'm getting, permission, I'm getting permission to continue. Now they're leaning in versus mm -hmm. pushing back because most people step, step into a, a network marketing business presentation pushing, most people, they're pushing back a little bit. In fact, probably 70% of the people Probably of the seventy of, of the remaining thirty percent, uh, five to ten percent of them are cynical, and then maybe the rest of them are really open. So you might only get ten percent that are really open when you mm. sit down with them, but the rest of them are skeptical. And skeptics are good because if you can overcome a skeptic, they become your best distributors. They just have questions. Well, just I pushing back just a little. I turned down. I mean, you said you joined eleven companies. I turned down. 11 companies before I joined network marketing. So I was the ultimate skeptic growing up in Utah where I felt like there was a company every other block. Everybody had been a part of 20 different companies. Everybody was teaching me how I can make a lot of money even though they had no business right. plan. I yeah. felt like I was never gonna do it. And so for me, once I decided to do it, I felt like I could really try to add some validity of, hey, look, I was the biggest skeptic. But what I love what and I, and I hope you're really, everybody's going to take something different. So I hope you're all taking notes on this. What Jordan is teaching, you have to understand. Listen, watch his personality. Your goal is you're never going to become Jordan. You're never going to become me. Hopefully not. Hopefully you become better than us. But you're going to become the best version of yourself. The goal is to apply these principles that are taught and apply them to your personality. What Jordan is teaching is what network marketing is. And what do I mean by that? Most people get into network marketing and they think sales. And unfortunately, when they everything in life is sales, I get it. I had to sell myself to get married to my wife. My kids are selling me on eating fruit snacks and, and having a Sprite every single day. I get it. I get it. Everything in life is sales. But there's a difference. There are hard closed sales where it feels like manipulation and you're just going to make them do it and they're going to be annoyed if they don't. And then there is sales which are true sales of trying to influence people to hopefully be open to seeing if it's a fit and what jordan is teaching is lead and i learned this from john maxwell great leaders lead through influence not through title so when he says permission to continue and when he gives suggestions what he's doing is, is he's influencing you in the direction he wants to go rather than hitting you over a head and saying, hey, you got to join my business. You're an idiot if you don't join. I can't believe you wouldn't join. And that is my style. The reason why I didn't join network marketing, the first 11 companies, because I always felt like I was going to have to hard close my friends. And I value relationships as much or more than anybody on the face of the world. You can't value relationships more than me. You can tie me. You can't value them more than me. That's how much I value relationships and people and not burning bridges. And I know Jordan is the exact same way. So someone like Jordan and myself, we want to find a way that, yeah, we can sell, but we want to do it through influence and maintaining relationships and helping to steer people to make an educated decision and getting them to be opening to opened to looking rather than just beat them right over and making it where it's awkward, where they don't want to talk to us for six months and they don't want to see us right for the next three months. So that, I mean, that would be my summary. You tell me if I misspoke or if, or if there's anything. No, you want to in add fact, to that. Relationship, relationship is, is most everything. It's not everything, but it's most everything. In fact, every single person that's done well in network marketing, without exception, it's not about them being good at closing it's about them being good at making friends and building relationships think about this for a minute somebody comes into your business and they've already got 
hundreds or maybe even thousands of friendships, people that really trust them. Why do they do well so quickly? Because it's really easy for them to send a text message or make a call to those people and say, I want to show you something. And there's no sales pitch at all. It's just, I want to show you something. And everyone says, yes, we need to get together. Everyone says, yes. Why? Because they've developed all these relationships. Now take this other person that comes into your business that for whatever reason they have, they don't know anybody. They, they've destroyed all the relationships they have or at the very, at the very uh, most, maybe they're, they just, their friends don't really, they, they don't feel like this individual cares all that much about them because they're all about themselves. Well, it's very difficult for those people to set up appointments and the harder they sell, the more their friends push back. And so if you could, if you could make an adjustment in your business, if, if you're having trouble prospecting, you're having trouble setting up appointments, you're having trouble um, getting people that are interested in meeting with you. If you were to make a shift, I would say really take a look at what you can do, really study what you can do to become better. Study the people that are really good at building relationships with the people that they know mm -hmm. without an intention, without the intention of trying to get them into something, but just building the relationship. That's where the real opportunity is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically sell less, network more. How would you act in this business if you knew right when you started you were going to be in it 10 years from now? And I think right. most of us feel like, well, yeah, that's how I think. But no, really think about that. How would you treat relationships? How would you maintain relationships? How would you not burn bridges? How would you act if you knew that you were going to be in this industry 10 years from now? And I promise that one simple thought. That's how I thought when I started this business. I said, if I'm going to do this, I know I'm going to be in this industry 10 years from now. I know it. I know it. And because of that, I, I think it helped me to have a lot more success and to do this business the right way through building and fostering relationships rather than thinking of this as a sales quick fix. Because look, there's a lot of things that you can do where you're going to make a lot more money than network marketing in a short period of time, a lot, a ton. This can be the most underpaid business in the beginning and the most overpaid business in the end. Yep. But if you're looking at this for what it is, as Jordan said at the very beginning, a residual income, which is what you should be looking at it as, then your perspective should change more of looking at it from a long-term perspective. And so that, I mean, for me, those are huge takeaways. And I, jo I know Jordan is so big on relationships and thinking this way. And I know him and I think in such a similar way that I love learning from him and his insights. What would be last bit of advice? And just so you know, Jordan's book, Beach Money, came out 10 years ago, 120 pages. He's got a newer version that will be out hopefully in the next three to four months. That no, no, no. Actually, my, my revised version of Beach Money, Rob, will be out in about a week, week and a half. Oh, the revised. And then the other book is out. In, yeah, right. Yeah, so the revised version is 170 pages. So. Right. I think they should call it beach money on steroids okay. and that'll be out in a week. And then he'll have another book that we'll talk about another time that will come out later. Um, but I am just so excited to get the updated revised vision, the more in depth version on that. But what would you leave is some parting advice for everybody that's tuning in, that's made it to the end and is watching this video. Absolutely. So thanks Rob. So, First, what I, would, what I would have you consider doing, one of the things that I might suggest that you do, actually, is um, to consider doing the impossible for you, whatever that is. So in other words, there are dreams that you have that you're afraid to write down because you're pretty sure they could never happen to you. Those are the dreams that I suggest that you write down. When you do that, everything changes. That's the first thing. And the second thing is understand that when you look all around us, our lives are made up of things um, and experiences that at one time in history were considered impossible. Everything mm -hmm. that was done once the first time at one point was probably considered impossible. So some of you might remember in the um, – I don't even know when it was. It was probably in the 90s 
when everybody thought sushi was gross. In fact, nobody ate sushi. If you were in a group of people and somebody said, let's go get sushi, everyone would say, that's disgusting. Today, if you're in a group of people and you say, and they say, let's go get sushi, and somebody says, that's disgusting, they're the oddball today. That's, a, that's something that you would have thought would have been impossible at that time frame that everyone would love sushi. Some of you, um, you know, before Starbucks, you could buy a cup of coffee on any corner, pretty much in any city in America, North America, even around the world. Gas stations had it for a nickel or for a dime or for 50 cents or a buck. You could buy it at convenience stores. And when Howard Schultz came along and said, I'm going to start charging five to seven dollars per coffee and I'm going to have Starbucks in every neighborhood in the world. Everybody said, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. But today, there's any time of day or night, there's lines of people at Starbucks. He did the impossible. Um, I, I do this with my life. Every year I write down three things that I believe are impossible for me, like going to space, like learning to become a helicopter pilot. Those were things that at the time that I wrote them, I knew they were impossible for me. I knew, but I also have a formula that works. And the formula is simple. Write it down, schedule it, trust the process, and see the job through. Write it down, schedule it, trust the process, and see the job through. Don't stop until you're done. When you do those four things, everything falls into place. And then all of a sudden, you're going to look back and you go, you know what? What I thought was impossible really wasn't impossible. It was just that I didn't have the courage to dream. So my, what I would leave you with is to stretch your dreams a little bit and consider doing the impossible for you, for your family, for your business, within your company. Do something that you believe is impossible. Take it on and step into it. Just step into it. That is, I mean, that is so powerful because I have all these names going through my head. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, on and on and on, Richard Branson. If you go, if you were to talk to them when they were 16 years old and they told you exactly, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this, what would you have said? You would say, that's crazy. That's impossible. If you would have talked to Jordan Adler when he just quit his 11th company and hadn't signed anybody up in network marketing, and he told you he was going to have 150,000 people on his team. What would you have said? What would you have said? Think about that. Think about anyone who's accomplished anything great. And they tell you before they had arrived at some point, you would have said that's absolutely impossible. So I love that exercise. of, And I love how you say write it down and trust in the process. And you're working towards that. And you're doing everything you possibly can. That's what I love about this industry. Around so many people that bring us up that empower us to believe more than we believe in ourselves my mentor when i started this industry he told me he said you're going to be the best of the best in this company you're going to be the top recruiter in this company i couldn't even fathom that i just didn't want to fail i wanted to make my money back and i became a top recruiter in a multi-billion dollar company as, as this introvert who's naturally very quiet i feel like i'm yelling right now just so you guys can hear me because I'm so soft-spoken when I'm just talking a normal conversation. I didn't even know that was possible. It's just mind-blowing to me. And so I, I love that. That is great parting advice. I appreciate you, Jordan, for making time. I appreciate everybody who was on. If you found value in this and you end up sharing this with your teams or, or on, on your personal Facebook, please drop a share in the comments. We'll do our best to reply and recognize you and We'll have to get Jordan on again later on when, when he has his next book come out as well and get some more additional insights because I know there's a ton of questions that we could go on for an hour and ask him. But enjoy your cabin. You've earned it, Jordan. And I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait for you to go to space because I know it's impossible and it's going to happen. It is. It is. And you're doing a great job, Rob. Thanks. Love the game of networking. Thank you. Bye, Appreciate everybody. It. Thanks, everybody, Thanks. for tuning in. Till the Bye. next time. Thank you.